Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our presentation on how to spring into the gardening season with pollinator friendly practices. Tonight, we are going to be hearing from Victoria Wittick of Save the Dunes and Carl Ackerman of Wild Ones. Um, we are broadcasting live on Facebook, so that's where you're watching this. If you have questions while you are listening to our presenters, please feel free to put them in the chat. If we have time at the end, we will address them during the live presentation. Um, if we do not, then we will follow up with you electronically. Uh, without further ado, I am gonna turn things over to Victoria to get us started. Thank you so much, Katie, and welcome everyone to a presentation on one of my favorite all-time topics pollinators and how you can support them in your in your home garden. Um, we have a lot of opportunities to support pollinators in the coastal region of Indiana. So we're very fortunate and lucky that that is the case. And I am very fortunate to be able to share a beautiful uh, pollinator garden landscaping guide that we put together at Save the Dunes last year. Um, so tonight's presentation, I will introduce the concept of, of biodiversity in the Indian Dunes and why it matters to you and walk you through this incredible resource we have, our, our Pollinator Garden Landscaping Guide. And then I'll hand it over to Carl, who's going to teach us more about how to prepare our gardens this spring with the pollinators in mind and um, some tips and tricks you can use when you're designing a garden for your pollinators. Um, and so at this stage, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can see the slides that I have put together for this evening. And it will take, there we are. Um, so we're springing into the garden gardening season with pollinator friendly practices. And some of you may realize that this is the front and back cover of our pollinator garden landscaping guide. This is an original photo taken by Susan Kurt in the Indiana coastal region. And we have a beautiful uh, pair of butterflies nectaring on our purple coneflower. So just a little tidbit to get you started. Um, our Living in the Dunes uh, volume two is actually um, a passion project of mine and it is so rich in content that you're not going to believe it. This is a free resource you can um, access on our webpage. And we also have printed hard copies available in our office. And so if you'd like a printed hard copy, please reach out to Save the Dunes and we'll make sure that you get one. Um, within the guide, you will find information about six ecosystems in the Indiana coastal region seven groups of native pollinators, dozens of native plants that you can put in your garden to support those native pollinators. And these native plants are featured in all of the ecosystems of the Indiana coastal region. And so we have six ecosystem themed template garden designs to help you pull native plants that are found in our ecosystems to support our native pollinators. So you're actually doing some restoration and conservation work at home in your garden when you're using um, the concepts in this guide. Uh, we also feature four incredibly beautiful illustrations of seasonal changes in a pollinator garden that Barb Labus um, graciously created for this guide. Um, we have eight story features on various pollinator topics. So the monarch butterfly and what um, is happening with their populations. Um, similarly, the rusty patched bumblebee. Um, content on honeybees, if you're interested in learning more about their role and the fact that they're actually not a native pollinator in Indiana. Um, fireflies, one of my favorite features of summertime and the fact that they actually are native pollinators. Uh, what is pollination? What is metamorphosis? Uh, what kinds of pollinator habitat can you create in your garden based on the conditions that you have at home. And finally, it wraps up with some resources on native plant sales, pollinator conservation, and how to start and maintain your garden and more. So the guide is rich in lots and lots of content. 
And before going any further, I want to acknowledge everyone that contributed to the creation of this guide, um, including everyone on our advisory committee, including, in, including Carl Ackerman, who's speaking with us this evening, um, and our project team. Um, so the graphic designers at Phoenix 7 Marketing and the landscape designers at Hitchcock Design Group, our um, local expert, Nathaniel Pilla, botanist at Orbis Environmental Consulting, Barb Labus, who created our artwork. Um, and so thank you to the advisory committee and project team for all of your incredible contributions to the guide. And also thank you to all of the funders that made it possible. Um, this project was initiated with support from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Lake Michigan Coastal Program in Indiana. And matching support was generously provided by BP, the McDougall Family Foundation, NIPSCO, and the Unity Foundation. We have been able to do lots of printing and outreach presentations like what you are enjoying this evening um, through the support of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and our, our pollinator work with partners in the region. And so my favorite, one of my favorite pieces of this guide is the quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teachings of Plants. And the quote goes like this, knowing that you love the earth changes you, activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that the earth loves you in return, that feeling transforms the relationship from a one-way street into a sacred bond. That message couldn't be any more important than it is today because although we love gardening and although we love our pollinators, pollinators are in trouble. And I'm going to pivot at this stage to another slide deck before going a little bit further into our Living in the Dunes guide to bring this message home. Um, and so here you're looking at an image of Earth from space. This I, I, um, I nabbed from NASA and it's the blue marble image of Earth and Earth is incredibly beautiful, um, beautiful to behold, beautiful to live on. Um, but what really sets Earth apart is the life that it supports. It has an astonishing diversity of life of all kinds, of plants, of animals, of mushrooms, of fish and invertebrates and uh, so much life on planet Earth. And it's this life, um, net, this network of life that makes all of the things that we need possible. So our biodiversity really supports life in, in and of itself. Um, unfortunately for, um, not just us, but for anything living on the planet, our biodiversity is in trouble because of a lot of global changes that are underway. Um, the Stockholm Resilience Center has some um, great content I'd encourage you to check out to understand that currently the earth is um, moving out of safe operating spaces for some of the critical life support systems, including biosphere integrity. This includes our biodiversity. And this is scientific, so we won't stay on it too long. This E um, slash MSY, that, that means ecosystems per million of species per million years. And right now we are in a situation where we're losing so many species. We're way outside of the safe operating space to sustain critical life support systems on the planet. Now we hear a lot about climate change in the news and it's true that we're also out of the safe operating space with climate changes, but look at the difference between how the magnitude of climate change and the increasing risk compared with the loss in biodiversity. This is a profound moment in our history and there are things that we can do, but we need to understand what, what that is that we can do. And part of that is knowing that it's happening. Now, tonight we're going to focus on our pollinators. And one of the reasons why I was inspired to bring this project and to save the dunes and connect with our committee and get funding for this and so grateful for the support is that our insects are actually in a very steep decline globally. This was a feature um, from the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one of 
the premier scientific institutions in the United States founded by Abraham Lincoln. This um, particular article came out in January of 2021, and it was the featured story um, for an article called Insect Decline in the Anthropocene, or Our Current Human-Dominated Age. And the subtitle is Death by a Thousand Cuts, Global Threats to Insects. And if we look at this um, graphic here, this informational graphic, um, we can see that there are a lot of threats. You know, so climate change and global warming, um, it, you know, are are some of the struggles that are some of the um, threats to pollinators and why they're struggling. Um, so fire, storm intensity, droughts, deforestation, um, all of these things connected to climate change. We also have um, nitrification or a lot of nitrogen being put into our environment, but in the way that we care for our landscapes, lots and lots of chemical light and sound pollution. This impacts wildlife, including our pollinators, urbanization and the fragmentation of our natural areas and you know, the islands, these pollinators can no longer connect their populations and that threatens them even more invasive species and I, any of you that are familiar with Save the Dunes and our partners would know that we work very hard to eradicate invasive species across the region, um, agriculture intensification and, and more. And so a death, death by a thousand cuts, insects are really in trouble. Um, this uh, regal fritillary is, an, is a butterfly native to Indiana. And can you imagine an Indiana without a regal fritillary? Have you ever seen one? Would you know how to support one in your garden? I'm sure you'd like to have one in your garden if you, if you had the chance. Um, but all of our insects are in trouble, not just the gorgeous you know, butterflies that we might be uh, more readily familiar with, but all types of insect groups are in trouble, including the other um, part of the Lepidoptera order, shares metamorphosis characteristics with the butterflies, the moths. Um, we also have our, our bees, we have flies, we have wasps, we have all kinds of insects that are in a lot of trouble right now. And so let me shift back over to uh, our pollinator garden landscaping guide to help you understand that in Northwest Indiana, we actually have one of the best chances to reverse the decline in insects simply because we live in one of the most biodi biodiverse assortments of ecosystems in North America, right? And so this map here shows pre-settlement um, ecosystem distribution in the Indiana coastal region, where the color differences indicate different ecosystem types. There's a lot of colors in this map. These colors each represent one of the ecosystems featured in the boxes here. And so we've laid out um, information for you about prairies, our coastal dunes, and here's a picture of a monarch caterpillar on a milkweed on the beach, our incredible dune and swale topography that's out here in Northwest Lake County, um, the astonishing diversity of wetlands. We have every type of wetland you could dream of from bogs to fens to marshes to swamps to all kinds, <laughs> pans, I'm trying to remember all of them. Uh, there are so many out here and they're incredible um, at not only supporting biodiversity of pollinators, but also filtering air, water, wonderful ecosystems out here. Um, we also have rare oak savannas. Now, if you think about all the green color here, we used to have a lot of oak savanna. That's actually a rare ecosystem in Northwest Indiana. Um, we have, and then we also have our woodlands. Um, and so think again, this is pre-settlement vegetation. And if you were out and about in Northwest Indiana, you'd quickly realize that we don't have all of this connected ecosystem, all of these connected ecosystems across our landscape anymore because the landscape has been transformed for our communities, our industries, our roads, our other infrastructure. And so what we're hoping that you will take home from, uh, take away and take home with you is this guide that teaches you how to pull elements from these natural ecosystems so that you have the capacity to support our native pollinators. And so as you move through the guide, you learn about what, what's happening in the world, why it's important in Northwest Indiana, what opportunity you have, 
learn about the ecosystems, and then you learn about some of the beautiful pollinators that would be supported in your home garden should you um, bring these concepts home. And so there are seven groups. Uh, we have, we're featuring five different bees. Um, so there's a group called mining bees. There's our bumblebees. These are the giant bumblers that hover around on wings that seem impossibly small to support their large bodies. We have the sweat bees that often feature this really cool metallic green coloration. Leaf cutter bees that actually cut leaves with uh, little pincers on either side of their mouth. And our mason bees, these are those furry um, little guys that look like they forgot to brush their hair and went out into the world anyway. So I love to say about them. Um, we also have our butterflies, right? And so when you put native plants in your garden, these native butterflies might visit because they need the native plants to support their life cycle, not just to nectar, like the uh, butterflies on the cover were doing, that was a red spotted purple and a painted lady nectaring on a cone flower. That's one thing that, will that the butterflies are looking for in your garden or nectar sources, but they're also looking for places to lay their egg. And so think back to that regal fritillary. Well, here, here we featured a great spangled fritillary. There's lots of different kinds of fritillaries, but all of them lay their eggs on violets. So if you don't have violets, which is a native plant, beautiful spring flower in your yard, you aren't going to have any food for great spangled fritillary babies. They're caterpillars. So there's lots of information in each of the flags on the pollinator um, groups that are featured, and they will help to identify a caterpillar host plant should there be one. And so again, like the great spangled fritillary, the caterpillar host plant, our viola species, the violets. Um, moving down, you see uh, you can support a Baltimore checker spot with turtle head. You can support red spotted purples with a variety of different trees. We do feature some trees in the guide too. Um, the um, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail is also supported by some native trees, flowering trees. Um, our Spicebush Swallowtail is supported by Spicebush. Um, and then we have our Monarch Butterfly, also a native butterfly that will only lay its eggs on milkweed species. Well, lucky again for us in Northwest Indiana in the coastal region, there's lots of native milkweed species. So you have an assortment of beautiful plants to choose from to incorporate into your garden. Moving forward through the guide, um, we next feature content on the moths. These are some of the beautiful moths that you may not realize are, um, are living in the natural areas in our region. Now imagine, if those natural areas, you know, some of us live near the Indiana Dunes National Park or State Park, you can go to the park to experience perhaps, you know, a, a walk through and, and seeing some of this wildlife. But if you live nearby and you put native plants in your garden that support them, then when they fly out of the park, they have somewhere else nourishing to go. And so that's part of the concept of how this is helping you to also do conservation work at home, is you are enhancing and the natural areas by providing connectivity across our fragmented landscape. Um, the ruby-throated hummingbird is another one of our pollinators. It's our only pollinating bird. Everyone loves hummingbirds. Um, you can attract hummingbirds with red flowers, and we have lovely native red flowers that they will come to nectar on in your garden. Um, we also have some pretty cute beetles. Um, so you're going to see these insects on your native plants once you start to put them in your garden, and that's a good thing. Sometimes people would ask, after planting milkweed, oh my goodness, there's so many different kinds of bugs on my milkweed. There, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm like, no, that means what you're doing is working. You want to see that life flourishing on your native plants in your garden. And these beetles are actually doing a service for you. They're pollinating those flowers so that the life cycle of the plant continues. So the life cycle of the pollinators and the life cycle of the plants are connected. It's wonderful. Um, believe it or not, we also have some very cute flies. Now, I'm not talking about the annoying house flies that you want to swat or get out of your house. I'm talking about like the great bee fly, which is this cute fuzzy little guy. 
or the hoverfly, which is an incredible mimic of bees that is uh, has adapted that coloration to ward off predators, right? Um, wasps are not all scary and horrible, believe me, they're not. Um, there are a lot of wasps that aren't gonna bother you at all. And you may at one point come across a great golden digger wasp. And if you are like me, and when you're in your garden, you're with a magnifying glass or you've got your camera out like Susan Kurt, or you're out creating artwork like Barb Labus, you might notice that the go great golden digger wasp has golden hairs. It's gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous. Um, so again, there, there's a lot of content in the sky and I've spent a good deal of time talking about the pollinators because that's the central message. They are in trouble and they need our help. And what a joy that we can help them through our native gardens. And again, you'll also learn um, about more aspects of pollinators and native gardening in our featured stories. Um, here, what you're seeing are the four original illustrations of seasonal changes in pollinator gardens um, that feature some of the concepts I've just mentioned. So here's a, a, a large bombus or bumblebee. They're one of the first bees to emerge in the spring. And so they really need folks to understand that um, they, they won't be able to emerge if you clean up your garden and take out all of the places where um, they have habitat. So leaving leaves in your garden um, and providing access to leaves in your garden ensures that these bumblers have a place to live throughout the winter. And when they emerge, one of the first to emerge in the spring, they're set up for success. Here, if you were to look closely, you would see the caterpillar of a fritillary butterfly. And this little guy is going to emerge and right on top of a violet and start to munch and crunch its way into its next stage, the fritillary. Um, and there are other bees featured in here and we're in spring. So um, hopefully in your garden, you might you know, want to include some of these specimens, you know, Dutchman's breeches, our bloodroot, uh, the Virginia bluebells, here's a service berry, here's a red bud, here's a tulip tree, here's a cherry. Uh, we've got columbine in the background, anemones, lupins. I mean, my goodness, there are lots of options. And this is the case when you look through the guide for each season of, uh, of the year. And so summer is a bounty. It's a bonanza for pollinators, especially if you incorporate some of the, the wonderful natives that support their life cycle. And so is fall. Remember, our monarchs migrate in the fall and they're gonna be looking for some nectar sources to fuel that, that migration. And so you may be standing near the shores of Lake Michigan and watching as the monarch butterflies are flying south over us. It's, it's, uh, it's so incredible to see, uh, but there's other pollinators still active at that time of year and they're going to need some nourishment too. So there are other things to put in your garden. Uh, to support them. And then of course in the winter, which I'm, I'm not sure that we're out of winter yet. I mean, it is technically spring, but it's awfully cold outside. And so right now what the pollinators are doing are getting ready to break hibernation, but they won't do that until the temperature is consistently above about 50 degrees for a solid week. Otherwise, they are still going to be living in that leaf litter. So here's the spangled uh, fritillary caterpillar when it's really, really, really small. Um, there's that bumblebee queen that's overwintered in the soil through the leaf litter. So she needs that to come out and emerge in the spring healthy. You have minor bees that will live in the soil. You've got swallowtail chrysalids that'll be supported on the plant stems in your garden. And you also have lots of other bees that live in the standing um, plant material in your garden. And so cleaning up your garden right now is not a good idea if you wanna support pollinators. And that's why I'm so excited. I'm gonna be turning it over to Carl in a moment to talk about some of those concepts to, to get you going. Um, within our guide, you will find some template garden designs. These are connected to our different ecosystem types. So the plant spe species lists that we've assembled for you here are the types of plants, beautiful flowering plants that support pollinators that you would find in native ecosystems that are then suited for your landscape. 
Um, so the woodland, the prairie, the wetland, the dune and swale, the coastal dunes, the oak savannas, we've assembled uh, lists of species from each of those ecosystems that would do great in your garden um, with your, you know, depending on your conditions. Um, and so then the guide finally starts to close up with a wonderful array of beautiful native plants that support pollinators. Um, these are organized by bloom time. So from spring, um, early spring, all the way through fall. Um, so some of those specimens that I mentioned in that first panel of artwork, the spring um, panel, um, the Dutchman's breeches, the Virginia bluebells, the bloodroot, um, I hope you are like me and know that um, Ritchie Nature Preserve by Shirley Hines Land Trust, managed in, uh, by Shirley Hines Land Trust, will be an explosion of trillions of trilliums in, in, in no time at all. Um, our common blue violets, for example, eastern red columbine, and then you start to get more into late spring and summertime, where it's a bonanza. And the list goes on. Isn't this joyful? Look how colorful and beautiful these plants are. You know, they come in different heights, um, different shapes, um, you know, with different types of conditions. And so each flag will help you to understand a little bit more about them. Um, we also worked very hard to find images of pollinators interacting with these species to again, drive home the point that these plants are a beauty to behold, a, a joy to have in your garden, but they, they are performing an essential critical function of helping our pollinators and they need our help. So what a joy, it's, it couldn't be more joyful to support um, our pollinators. Um, so there we have that. And then wrapping up the plant lists, um, at the bottom you will find a list of native trees, shrubs, and vines that also support our pollinators. So if you're looking to incorporate woody perennials into your landscape, I know my personally, I'm looking to put in a redbud or well, I'm not sure if it's gonna be a flowering dog. Anyway, I'm gonna put in a flowering tree this year. Um, you know, of small stature. I don't have a place where I I can let anything grow very tall, so but it's very sunny. So that will be um, what I'm up to this in, in not too not too long. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, and finally, we have this information of how to maintain your garden. So again, like your spring cleanup and your fall cleanup, how to get started, what are some of the essential features of pollinator gardens to support the entirety of their life cycle, and then a bunch of resources for you. And some of the resources that I wanted to highlight this evening are our native plant sales. And so the Friends of the Indiana Dunes, one of the partner organizations that does great work in the region, they have a native plant sale coming up. The Wild Ones, Gibson Woods chapter um, that Carl, Carl Ackerman will talk about in, in just a moment, has an incredible native plant sale coming up as well. That's where I stock up on my native plants, um, but when that, time of year passes and I'm, I'm trying to find things to incorporate in my garden at other times of the year, you know, my staple is Chesterton Feed and Garden. They've got a wonderful assortment of native plants, but there's all kinds. There's all kinds. Um, you can go online to Prairie Moon Nursery, for example, and order some plants if you like to get started really early and do some growing indoors. Um, and so there's lots and lots of information here. I hope you find it not only inspirational um, and useful, I mean, just imagine in your garden, you could behold the incredible beauty of a painted lady butterfly, which looks completely different on the top than it does on the bottom. And just, they're just so incredibly beautiful. I wanna do everything I can to bring more of them into my garden. And when I figured out that, wow, I could help with a really big problem in the world in this joyful way, I couldn't wait to get started and I'm always learning more. And so again, this guide is available on our website. You can download it, an electronic copy, along with our volume one of Living in the Dunes, which, which talks more about invasive species. And so you can go to savedunes.org, find our resources tab and get started, download your copy. And so with that, I say thank you. I hope you're still with us and ready to learn even more from my um, dear colleague, Carl Ackerman of Wildlands.
Oh, you're on. I think you're still on mute, Carl. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, and thanks, thanks a bunch, Vicki. It's a, a pleasure working with you, and I, I learned so much and get inspired. And so um, I'm going to continue on where uh, Vicki left off and talk about a couple things. And I'm going to get into some of the specifics. I'm sharing the screen now of a presentation uh, uh, about spring cleaning. And uh, early on, um, you know, I, when I grew up, you know, early on, we used to rake our leaves in the fall. And we used to just, you know, put them out to the curb and burn them. And we just, you know, we burned our own leaves. And then after, you know, burning was not in vogue anymore, we used to, you know, rake them up in the fall and then bag them. And then um, when spring came, the first, you know, early days, you know, I would hoe my garden as, you know, as soon as possible. I would you know, continue raking up and cutting back things as soon as possible because, you know, I wanted my yard to look nice. Um, so these pictures here, the one on the left is my backyard, um, how it looked about uh, a week ago. And you can see, you know, of course I do have a lot of leaf litter, my grass and grasses are still standing. The, st the stems of my uh, uh, perennials are still standing. You know, way in the back, you can see a little uh, greenhouse, walking pop-up greenhouse, which is a lot of fun. I propagate a lot of things by seed. So, you know, native uh, plant sales are great, but you can, you know, propagate your own plants as well. Um, this uh, in front of that pop-up garden uh, or pop-up greenhouse is a, uh, a berm you know, that I formed with uh, using wood uh, framework. And then on the right-hand side, this picture is my front parkway. And uh, about uh, four or five years ago, I just took the leap of faith. Hey. This front parkway is, was lawn, but now it's, it's uh, you know, native plants. And um, again, I'm just gonna you know, leave it the way it is pretty much until you know, things start greening up. So, one slide. So when and why to start spring cleaning? So a lot of the whys um, Vicki went over because you know, the, the why is that we want to have our habitat, you know, have, have habitat for our insects because, you know, many pollinators in, uh, overwinter in the dead plant material. And if you clean it up too early, you know, the, the bees and the butterflies that are overwintering there, of course, you know, will get destroyed. So should you do fall cleanup? The answer is no. Uh, should you do spring cleanup? And the answer is yes, always spring, do spring cleanup rather than the fall. And again, um, in addition to the, uh, the pollinators that are in there, in, in that leaf litter, you know, there's uh, microbes and you know, a lot of other insects, you know, the beetles and things um, that you know, feed our birds and you know, out of the food chain. And so, you know, the big question, you know, sh when should I clean up my garden? Well, uh, there's pollinators, a chance to emerge and, uh, you know, complete their uh, life cycle. You know, if they're emerging, emerging as a pupa um, or a caterpillar, then they have to pupate and then they have to, you know, turn into uh, an adult. So the rule of thumb, again, um, it's not necessarily a hard and fast rule, but you know, Vicki mentioned this, it is 50 degrees Fahrenheit um, consistently, consistent 50 degrees. So that means both day and night. And uh, in doing some research for this uh, presentation, the 50 degree um, temperature came up a couple of times. And then somebody uh, also mentioned, uh, when would you, um, you know, put your tomato plants outside, you know, if, you know, 50 degrees during the day, of course, um, we want your uh, tomato plants to, uh, you know, thrive as well. So when you're doing your uh, cleanup in the spring, there's, um, of course, you know, the leaf litter that uh, what you can do is, you know, take your, you know, piles of leaves you know, from a, a part of the yard that uh, maybe it's still lawn that you use for entertaining or, you know, your kids play in, or if it's more of a formal garden, 
you can move those piles of leaves to a, a less disturbed, undisturbed area you know, of your yard. And uh, this is, was uh, the resource that I used for a lot of this uh, uh, material that I got you know, to put these slides together. Uh, this left-hand picture is a great, uh, this thing's about a seven page leaflet. Um, it's called Life in the Leaf Litter. And it uh, was put up by the American Museum of Natural History. It's, uh, for me, it was really, really interesting. Of course, it has uh, you know, all things about worms and centipedes and microbes and all the life that's in the leaf litter. And you know, regarding the biosphere that uh, Vicki mentioned, you know, this thin sliver of uh, life that surrounds our planet, it's uh, really, really fascinating. And it's arguably there's more you know, life underground than there is above the ground. Um, and then this thermometer here, I have a picture just to reinforce that it is a 50 degree you know, guideline consistently both day and night to um, give our, again, give our uh, life in the leaf litter, you know, the pollinators a chance to uh, complete their life cycles and continue on with their life cycles. So how to go about spring cleaning. So you can use leaf litter uh, for mulch. It's a great way to recycle the debris in your yard. Um, you can use, you know, dried leaves is mulch. And what you can do is um, like on the bottom left-hand uh, picture, um, use three to four inches of uh, you know, leaves around uh, uh, shrubs and trees. And uh, one of the neatest things that um, you know, I discovered, <laughs> of course, I didn't discover it, it was uh, I started doing though anyway, was uh, creating thickets, thickets of shrubs. So I do have uh, thickets of shrubs surrounding my yard, you know, on the three sides of my yard. And so this uh, shows a, a Again, a cyclone fence, so you can see my neighbor's green grass on the other side here, but I have a three or four inches of uh, leaves um, you know, surrounding this uh, thicket of shrubs. And it's okay to leave some bare spots. You know, some of the um, you know, bees that burrow underground you know, need some bare spots as well. So it is okay to have some bare spots. Um, this middle picture, is uh, again moving leaves, you know, from a formal area to informal perennial beds. So I'll call this an informal perennial bed. It's a berm that I have in the back of my yard. It's the one that's framed up by the wood, uh, just tree stumps and logs and things like that. And it's about a 30 inches berm, uh, two layers of uh, 15 inches. And in the back of the berm, you see the spot here that is in the back of the berm is uh, twigs and sticks. And I originally started putting those back there to, um, to prevent erosion um, in the back of the berm. But as, as you know, things progressed, I realized, hey, wow, these twigs and repurposing sticks and branches you know, the, to prevent the erosion on my berm was also creating habitat. There's lots of uh, birds that nest back there. And it's really interesting how um, you can repurpose sticks and branches as well. And so, in the last three or four years, I really, I have not put anything out to my front lawn, um, you know, for the village to take away, either, you know, sticks or twigs, sticks or uh, leaves. You now everything is getting repurposed into my backyard. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now to talk uh, specifically about bees. And uh, Heather Home um, is a resource that I use uh, to get a lot of my information about bees. So uh, she has a few books out and I encourage you to uh, you know, read those. She also has um, some interviews uh, on the web and I've got this information you know, from uh, interviews. So um, you know, we did talk, you know, Vicki mentioned bees of course, and you know, some bees nest above ground and some bees nest underground. And there's about 3,700 species of bees in the US with you know, all different kinds of life cycles of which about 30% of those bees do nest above ground. So that means there's quite a bit of bee, you know, number of bees that nest below ground. And so they're down there you know, during the winter time, you know, waiting to uh, you know, come out in the springtime. And so you know, some bees, you know, again, they have all different kinds of life cycles and some bees are you know, active as adults for only four to six weeks. 
you know, when your spring ephemerals are coming out, like the trilliums and the blood roots and things like that. And then some species of, you know, bees are active for much longer. But essentially, you know, just like all critters, um, these, uh, you know, bees need food, water, shelter, and a place to rear their young, those four essential things for habitat. So they're looking for, again, we, we want to create habitats in our backyard. And again, as Vicki said, just, you know, of course there's habitat around the dunes, you know, undisturbed areas. But once those critters leave that area, we want them to be able to start finding habitats in our backyards to form that connectivity. So those uh, four essential elements for the habitat are food, water, shelter, and a place to rear their young uh, for the whole life cycle. And again, uh, you know, some bees uh, build their nests uh, below the ground. So regarding bee nesting, you know, I, I was listening to this um, interview online. It was really uh, interesting. So the uh, bees that uh, nest above ground, they're looking for stems of plants, you know, like uh, pith filled uh, flower stalks. Um, Heather Holm mentioned about uh, plants in the aster family again, are good examples, or some woody plants uh, like elderberry, sumac, um, that have pithy or hollow centers for the bees you know, to uh, uh, excavate, to make their nests in. And then um, you know, some bees, of course, because if they you know, nest in uh, stems of plants, they like vertical um, nests. And then you know, some, we mentioned some bees nest in the ground. And then some bees like the horizontal nests. And so if um, you're you know, doing some spring cleanup, you know, leave the uh, vertical stems of your plants, you know, about 15 inches or so, you know, just eyeball it. You know, the bees don't have you know, rulers out there. So maybe, you know, if you want to leave a little bit longer stems, of course, that's okay. But um, you know, leave the stems of the plants. Um, you can, of course, maybe snip off the tops. But just you know, leave them fall to the ground. You know the tops of the plants because again, those will uh, that will create mulch. So the the vertical stems, you know, leave about 15 inches. And you know, how long do you leave those uh, stems there? Well, the answer is forever, because the bees' life cycle is such that you know they're coming and going and coming and going and coming and going. And um, there's many different life cycles for many different bees. So it's best just to leave those uh, you know, vertical stems forever until you know, nature takes its course and they fall to the ground. Uh, leave some you know, bare patches on the ground because you know, some bees you know, want to be able to get in and out of the ground you know, with, uh, from the nesting. And then um, I do have a couple of snags, uh, dead trees in my backyard. And um, the one closest to my house, I did cut down to about a 12 foot tall so it's not going to fall on my house. So it's no danger of falling. So if you could lay out, uh, have uh, you know, dead trees, a snag in your backyard, you know, it's great for insects. And you know, the insects, you know, the, like horizontal nests, they'll bore into the side of those, um, of those so dead trees, make their nests. Then of course the, the woodpeckers are going to come along and um, you know, find uh, food but, you know, for in the winter time. So this is a uh, you know some more description from, from the dialogue. I left this. This is just kind of a, a wordy slide, but it was kind of interesting listening to the dialogue because um, she mentioned twenty inches, then twelve inches, and then she <laughs> settled on fifteen inches of stubble. So um, it, again, for me, I just found that interesting and a little bit funny because I just thought you know bees don't have rulers out there trying trying to measure you know how high how high the uh, the stalk is. And then she mentioned, you know, the different types of fibrous stalks, you know, the sturdy stems of goldenrods, asters, black-eyed Susan coneflowers, and so on. Just, you know, all our native plants you know, that uh, you know, we're going to be planting in our garden. So I'll switch gears uh, from butterflies to talk a little bit about, uh, I'm sorry, uh, from bees to talk about butterflies. So butterflies do uh, essentially have the four uh, stages of their life cycle, the egg, the caterpillar, the chrysalis, and the adult. And 
the butterflies, you know, just like, uh, you know, bees have different life cycles and the butterflies have different life cycles as well. So butterflies like the uh, swallowtail, they'll, you know, go through the winter time in the, the pupa stage uh, in our garden. The skipper butterflies, they'll go through um, the winter time as caterpillars. The little coppers and blues remain as eggs. You know, of course, the monarchs, they do uh, migrate and they'll go south. But then the uh, a butterfly like the morning cloak will hunker down and spend the winter as adults. And this bottom picture is a uh, picture of a morning cloak uh, that I spied in my yard. I, took, I was able to take the picture. It might have been last year or the year before, but it was nectaring on a uh, milkweed. So it's nectaring on the milkweed but it's gonna overwinter as an adult somewhere in the leaf litter, hopefully in my garden or my next door neighbor's garden. And of course, we're all, connect, all our gardens are connected. And um, if my morning cloak spends the winter in my garden and goes to the neighbors next door, hey, more power to everybody. Um, and I got this material from uh, Kent McFarland. So what are the benefits of leaving grasses uh, over the winter? So grasses, um, you know, they are, they do provide, you know, habitat, you know, they provide uh, uh, habitat for, you know, insects, the, you know, things that are overwinter, overwintering as eggs or, or you know, pupa or adults. Um, but again, it's habitat, it's, you know, foraging for um, the winter, winter birds like sparrows and juncos and, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, again, it's a uh, landscape interest, you know, wind reduction, so you don't just get, you know, the windswept um, you know, landscape. And if you leave it for the spring, it uh, is actually easier to cut down in the spring, you know, after it's 50 degrees, you know, maybe you can cut it down. But again, leave the uh, debris that you cut down, you know, you can leave it adjacent, you know, to the, you um, um, you know, the stems of the plants that you just cut or, you know, move it to an undisturbed area. Um, a rule of thumb for grasses is to leave about a, a third of the grass in place or about three to four inches. Again, these are, uh, you know, some guidelines. So we're gonna switch gears here. So that was the first part of spring quick cleanup. And now I'm gonna be talking about uh, designing a native landscape. So perhaps uh, you're you know, getting started and um, you're going to one of our plant sales. And so before you go to the plant sale, you may want to do some homework. Hey, you're interested in native plants. How, I, how do I go about uh, designing a native landscape? You know, get my garden started. So my garden, you know, I've been at, at uh, my house for 20 years. Now I always liked planting things for, um, you know, I would open a book and pick out, you know, plants that showed a picture of a butterfly or showed a picture of a hummingbird or showed a picture of a bee. But when I joined uh, the Wild Ones in 2015, you know, the big hammer hit me over the head like dong. And then I started reading Doug Talame and, and, um, and now, of course, I'm all about native plants. But so, so this is how, so my, it's kind of, Patchwork. Um, you know, I have you know areas that are sunny, some areas that are wet, some areas that are more you no know, shade or you no know, semi, um, you know, not full sun, and um, things kind of evolved. Of course, I made tons of mistakes, and you no know, things didn't uh, you know thrive like I thought they would, but maybe they ended up and they did. Some of my liatris that didn't thrive over here are doing really well over there, and um, so when you get started. You know, uh, you know, scope out your yard, um, you know, lay the groundwork, talk to your neighbors. If there's, uh, you know, weed or fire ordinances, um, I showed the picture of my front, uh, front parkway, you know, in between the, the sidewalk and the street. And um, I've had my councilman over <laughs> for a garden walk and he saw that. And of course, no, uh, my neighbors, um, some of them support it, some of them don't care. But a lot of the dog walkers that walk by, you know, are really interested. So when I sit on my front porch, anyway, talk to your neighbors, um, you know, uh, look at the, if there's weed or fire ordinances, 
in uh, Munster, I live in Munster. And so far, um, no, I haven't gotten any trouble. Now I have posted signs out there, hey, this is a, a butterfly habitat um, or a, a wild native wildlife habitat. So I do have signs out there. Um, some natural features that you already have present could have a natural feature, of course, your house. You have to be able to design around your house. Uh, we may have some large trees or some existing shrubs that you like, uh, you know, design around those uh, types of things. You may have some native plants already. Um, so, you know, I do have some non-natives in my yard. I got to admit, I do have some lilies of the valley um, that you know reminds me of my mom. So I do um, have some non-natives as well. Um, you know, different types of habitat. Uh, we mentioned uh, you know, shade, sun, uh, wetter areas, invasive plants. You probably have some of those. I, I, of course, I do. And um, yeah, I draw things out on paper. It's real uh, helpful to do that. Um, for, you know, for the planning stage because then you get a, a space perspective. You know, how many plants potentially do you want to buy? Uh, start slowly, even if it's just a uh, you know five foot by five foot patch. Um, you know, yeah, the, the important part is to get started. Um, again, consider you know putting a sign up, especially if it's in the front yard. You know, to let some people know uh, what you're doing, and um, you know, clustering flowers and grasses. You know, put, putting things in clusters gives it a sense of space and a sense of design. Um, potentially could attract more wildlife if you have you know two or three um, you know, types of uh, you know two or three aster plants together clumped it, you know maybe the bees will uh, you know find it uh, more easily uh, you know look at the blooming times of plants that you you know want to purchase you probably do want things that you know bloom you know early in the spring and some things that are summer blooms and some things that are later blooms it gives interest you know all year round yeah, using some popular natives, um, you know, popular things like, of course, you know, milkweed is a popular, asters are popular, but those popular ones are you know, popular for us humans, but they're probably also popular for the, uh, for the, um, the uh, uh, pollinators as well. Um, you know, rocks and logs, you know, I use uh, uh, wood and logs they're easier, much easier to move around than rocks. Once you put a rock down, it's very difficult to get back up. Um, leaving food on the ground, yeah, being discreet with water features. I do have a pond in the yard. Uh, you know, again, draw your landscape plan. Draw it out on paper. It gives you, again, a good sense of uh, perspective. Also, um, a helpful hint is to use, like if you have a five by five uh, plot that you wanna do, you can use a piece of rope and you know, put that around that uh, plot of land or um, a hose, you know, just again, give you a sense of space um, you know, as a border. So here's are some uh, examples of plant sales. You know, the Friends of the Dunes that Vicki mentioned, I think that's uh, April 29th this year. And our, I, I'm going to These are some nurse, uh, um, questions, you know, to ask the nursery, hey, are these things locally grown? Are they uh, local ecotypes? Eco so, of course, you know, people advertise native plants, but you might find out that it's native to Appalachia or native to the Ozarks or native. And, of course, I went through that phase. Hey, I, bet I bought some red bee balm, uh, Monarda. I think it's called Jacob's Climb Monarda. And I found out, yeah, it's native, but it's native to the... Appalachians, or I, you know, I planted some witch hazel, and um, there's a couple different kinds of witch hazel. And I first I bought the one that's native to uh, the Ozarks, so you know it did survive. It did you know well up here, but uh, you know look for you know plants that are uh, more local. Uh, you could uh, plant different types of milkweeds, you know, different species of milkweeds. You know, the swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, cum milkweed. 
So yeah, you know, there's going to be a few pictures of slides or a few slides here, pictures of uh, butterflies because we all like looking at butterflies. So yeah, these are some different. Uh, we mentioned some uh, butterflies use trees as uh, their native host plant. So when you're you know planting your garden or planting your garden, you may want to if you have areas you know for trees, you know think uh, about that as well. Some native trees. Some swallowtail uh, species use uh, golden Alexander's dill, cilantro, parsley. Painted lady that uh, we were looking at earlier with the uh, Vicky slides. Asters are host plants as well. The checker spot, the butterflies, I think, uses asters as well. Pearly crescent. Oh, maybe it's the pearl crescent. Yeah. Sunflowers, the pea family. So yeah, there's a wide variety of uh, you know, flowers. And again, the uh, the guide that uh, you know Vicky you know showed, you know, has a lot of these plants in there. And grasses are again, so you know, uh, flowering plants, but grasses are important to you know have in your garden. It's part of that uh, diversity and habitat. So avoiding pitfalls. So uh, the first one, native plants will sleep, creep, and leap. That what that refers to is that uh, you know, when you get your plants home and you, you, know, you do plant them, maybe, maybe they, they're not looking that they're flourishing really well. And part of the reason is that they have to recover from the transplanting. So they're um, maybe, I'm not gonna say dormant, but uh, they're still recovering, I'll say, you know, from the transplanting. Uh, creeping, you know, their leaf, the, uh, the roots are growing. They're uh, getting established, you know, the second year. And then the third year, phew, you know, they, <laughs> they leap. You know, the green foliage really kicks in. Um, yeah, small prairie beds. Uh, you know, if you buy a mix of seeds, be wary. Um, I have gotten uh, seed mixes in the mail. You know, thank you gifts. And I think something was from, um, I'm not gonna say who it was from, but uh, there are some you know, uh, this species there from China and they even you know, had China in the name of the uh, plant. Um, yeah, use uh, tall plants in the back, uh, large plantings or long buildings or fences. So yeah, look at the heights of the plants. Um, yeah, try to avoid the pre-made mixes unless you're doing a really, really large area. And um, yeah, uh, species tend to follow the sun. Of course, you know, sun, we know sunflowers do. It's fun monitoring the plants you know, to see what's doing well. And again, you may make some mistakes. You know, I've made tons of mistakes. And um, you know, try, you know, try to remember or even you know, make a log. Hey, I planted something over there. Prairie smoke, I remember, is one of them. How come I pray? Well, they it got drowned out by my asters and other getting plants. You know, having crisp edges, and they are native. They are cultivars made from uh, used uh, native plants. And our Wild Ones website has a statement about native ours on there. And uh, when you're doing your homework, uh, if you have the gumption, I encourage you to read that native ours statement. But I'll kind of summarize it. Um, uh, Doug Talame is one of our honorary members or honorary, honor, our honorary board of directors you know, for the Wild Ones. And you know, he even said that uh, you know, we're never going to return our landscape to the way it was 300 years ago. So, um, you know, with that said, you know, people should do their homework and ultimately make, you know, their best decisions, you know, based on, you know, their knowledge and asking around and things like that. So here are some examples of, uh, you know, getting a garden started in the front yard. You know, with, uh, you know things are going to look messy. 
and uh, you know, with your uh, you know diagram, your that you've created, you can you know put things uh, where they're going to find their home. You have a little sign, you know, things along the fence, having rows. So these are some caricatures, um, you know, using stars or other symbols. But it's again, it's just important. To, you may want to, you know, clump grasses, some short grasses in the front, front like you know, little blue stem. Um, you know, different, you know, thing, different symbols for things that uh, flower the different times of year. Um, you could have your plant, your tall plants in the middle, you know, with a decreasing size, you know, toward the edges, or your, you know, it depends on you know where your space is. Again, you can use a string or a rope or a hose to uh, you know, create your circle, to give you know, your large circle to give you a sense of space. You can move it around. You know, using you know, edging keeps things neat looking. You know, different symbols for different uh, you know, flowers for uh, potentially you know, flowering at different times of the year. Uh, symbols for grasses. Again, you can create your you know chart. You can have a you know full sun area, a sunny and moist area. Uh, you know, part in shade, part shade area. So yeah, these are oops. Yeah, so these are again some examples of way to you know organize your thoughts uh, when you're creating your garden. And this is the um, template of garden designs that uh, you know we have in the um in the save the dunes brochure and again these are instead of using caricatures these are uh, essentially you know done by a professional landscaper a uh, garden uh, landscaper with the uh, different types of uh, specific uh, species that you can use incorporate in your garden it talks about you know different what the species are and um your sun rain Oak Savannah, things like that. Some resources, feel free to take a picture of this. Again, uh, there's lots of resources out there once you start doing some research. Some useful books. Yeah, I do. Uh, there's the, the bottom one by uh, Heather Holm, the bee person. And then this is a flyer for our uh, Wild Ones plant sale. So Saturday, May 7th from nine to three at the Oak Ridge Prairie, and uh, that's in Griffith. So feel free to take a picture of this or it's at our Gibson Woods uh, Wild Ones website as well. But yeah, we'd love to see you out there. So with that, I wanna say a big, big thank you. Thank you, Carl. Wow, I always learn so much when you share your knowledge with us about how to make a native garden a reality. Mm -hmm. And your cadence is such that it, I find it, it's like, wow, this is actually meditative to think about, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my energy is a little high sometimes. And so I'm yeah. like, wow, this is so clear and, um, you know, tangible for me. I feel like I can do this. And, um, and as much as, yeah, yeah. And as much as I, I love, you know, reading about it and doing my homework, there is nothing like going for a tour of a native garden. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure, Katie, um, if we have questions in the chat, but I'd love to get us started a little bit. I've, I've got a question for Carl. Mm, um, sure. um, I'm wondering um, if you could share again the date of your Wild Ones native plant sale and then, you know, is there anything else that Wild Ones are doing later in the year um, that could give people access or experience to how the garden, a native garden looks like later in the growing season? Okay, well, uh, our plant sale is uh, May 7th. It's, I believe it's the first Saturday of May, and it's at the Oak Ridge Prairie in Griffith. And then, um, you know, later on in the year, we do have uh, projects that we do. 
and um, nothing, I mean, we have projects in the works. For example, we just did something at the end of the year at the Doak, um, I think it's called the Doak uh, Farm or the Doak uh, Property. And I'm not sure where that is. I didn't work on that one, but uh, we do have projects throughout the year. I am gonna have a garden walk at my house um, sponsored through the um, Munster, the town of Munster. And it's not scheduled yet. Um, I have to get back to them later this year, um, or later this week, actually, with uh, you know, proposed times of the year and when that's going to be. But I will have a garden walk at my house uh, later this year, again, sponsored through the town of Munster. Um, we will uh, meet at Gibson Woods, or the Wild Ones will meet at Gibson Woods in the fall to do a, um, a seed swap. So again, um, you could buy plants or propagate, you know, start things by seed. And it's very gratifying. And we do have workshops that show how to do that, how to propagate things by seed. There's a process called uh, winter sowing where you can use milk jugs and to create your own little, you know, greenhouse, you know, kind of habitat. Uh, yes, I've seen, I think I've seen some of um, that kind of activity and programming yeah. at Hindley Hines. So, yeah, it's really cool. So um, there's lots of ways to get started in native plants. So you may want to buy some things to get started because people want, you know, quick gratification. But once you get started, you can start, uh, you know, do the propagation and do more planning and things like that. Um, so yeah, later on in the year, we're going to have a seed swap. We're going to meet at the uh, Gibson Woods and then we'll be able to, you know, see the, well, the front of Gibson Woods, you know, at the, um, the community center there. You know, you'll see things in fall and you know, starting to go you no know, dormant and going to seed. But um, yeah, there's lots of opportunities, you know, year round to uh, get involved in the wild one. So yeah, gardening is not just a spring or summer thing. It is a year round mm -hmm. thing. You know, like I have my little pop-up greenhouse in the back. Right. Um, you know, so it is a year round activity. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing um, that information. I'm really excited that you're doing a garden walk this year. Um, I still um, learn, you know, think back to visiting your garden last year for our pollinator week programming mm -hmm. and learned so much. I mean, I think it was the very next day I was cleaning up in my garden and picking up sticks and I had already a little pile going on the side of my garage. And now I've got the pile, I've got uh, <laughs> of, of twigs on either side of my planting bench on the side of my yeah. garage. Mm -hmm. And then I had like old stumps and, you know, I was just, how am I ever going to get these stumps out of my yard? They're so heavy and hard to move that I was like, oh my goodness, this is habitat for the bees. Yeah. And I've got this cute little fairy garden kind of set up back there. Yeah. Where, yeah. And so thank you. Thank oh, you. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Yeah. good. And if people wanted to um, find out about upcoming events at Wild One or um, to, you know, learn about the date of your garden walk. Can they sign up for the Wild Ones newsletter or is there a, you know, a good way to stay in touch? Yeah, thanks. So um, at the Gibson Woods Wild Ones uh, website, you know, we have our own website for the Gibson Woods chapter. Uh, we have all our activities on there and we post, uh, we have a, a monthly um, newsletter. You can uh, look at our monthly newsletter coming up Very good. so um yeah thanks for reminding me we do do that mm -hmm. we have about 65 chapter or 65 members in our local chapter or even 70 now and um most of our meetings have been zoom uh meetings lately but right now we are working in our greenhouse uh you know getting ready for the plant sale we do uh, raise our, our our plants and we'll buy plugs or start some grasses by seed and then nurture them and get them ready for the plant sale. And um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And so people can join the Wild Ones as a member and then they sure. can volunteer to participate in your greenhouse activities or to help mm -hmm. support your plant sale or, right. yeah. I'm actually on the National Board of Directors now. Right. And uh, so we do have over 6,000 members nationally. I think we're over 60 chapters in 20 states. And of course, it's, it is a growing movement and it's really exciting. So. You know, I, I uh, recently heard that one of our other Pollinator Guide Committee members, the incredible, wonderful Steve Sass, mm -hmm. has helped mm -hmm. to found a Wild Ones chapter in South Bend. South Bend, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I there's know. two. 
There's two chapters in Indiana now, the, the Northwest, oh, cool. Indiana, Northwest and so out cool. of Hammond and yeah, South Bend. And, and I'm right in the middle in Porter County. And so I'm like, I, I need to go, you know. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that often occurs to me is there are lots of wonderful garden clubs in different communities around mm. Indiana. So you may you know have to drive a little bit to go to your Wild Ones meeting. But you can bring that knowledge home to your local garden club, oh, share sure. concepts, and start to integrate more of the Wild Ones philosophy into mm -hmm. what you're doing in your hometown and your home community. Exactly. Yeah, the Miller Garden Club is very active. You know, from Mil a lot of folks from Miller Beach uh, belong to our Wild Ones group. Uh, Master Gardeners, you know, we're, we're you know partners with the Master Gardeners as well. They do great work and. Um, um, we have uh, many of our members are master gardeners as well. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you shared slides from Isa from the Field Museum. Um, mm. She and her colleagues um, at the Field Museum are doing some really great work sharing resources across the Chicago wilderness region. Um, and I believe that they are seeking information about where native plants are being planted, in oh. particular milkweed. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're trying to uh, figure out how many more milkweed stems need to be planted in the Chicago wilderness mm -hmm. area yeah. in order to sustain our populations at healthy oh. levels. Exciting. So thank you for folding that in. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Laura Milkert was another one from the Field Museum, was another one of our committee members. Yeah, yeah. So um, I also uh, wanted to to say once again that we have hard copies of the, the pollinator guide. They're full color, they're beautiful. And at the back, um, a lot of the resources that Carl mentioned are, are here. And this is, you know, as he says, it's like a brochure, it's a booklet, um, but it's bite-sized information that mm -hmm. we hope will help to get you started. Uh, but when Carl was talking and sharing his favorite books and, and resources, I was like, oh, that's how I got together, you know, the idea for the guide is I had my, I started out with bigger resources. And so, um, you know, I have a passion for butterflies. So I've got my, my butterflies yeah, of Indiana by Jeffrey Bell. And I, you know, it's all tabbed up and, you know, I'm always digging into this to learn more about, you know, our native butterflies. This is one of my favorite books. Um, there's also, you know, when you're out in your garden, when you've started you know, the process and you're seeing um, the impact, the positive impact and the pollinators are visiting. Um, if you're like me, one of the most joyful things to do is to try to identify them, you know, mm. figure out what they're doing and, you know, maybe even get a picture. Um, and so Butterflies of Indiana, this is um, a waterproof handheld fold out. Um, I picked this up at the Dorothy Buell Visitor Center um, on uh, 49 in, in Chesterton. And it identifies our native butterflies, but it will also show you um, what their caterpillar looks like. Oh, wow. And it identifies their host plant. Mm -hmm. And so in the guide, we only had so we only had enough space to include a couple of butterflies, uh, but there are really wonderful resources out there where you can get all of them, right? And so through that process, and then Desi Robertson from the Indiana Dunes National Park and her expertise on bees, now I am more passionate about bees than I ever thought possible. Um, and so I was, I start, I've started the process. I'm like, I need to know how to identify all these incredible bees that are on my native flowers. I have um, the, my, one of my favorite spaces in my house is a window seat that is right next to a native planting. And so I sit there at the window and I watch all the bees land on my mm. flowers planted there. And then I have my bee guide and I sit there and, you know, try to identify who's visiting in my garden. Uh, right? uh, <laughs> and then I'm, you know, I've I'm, I'm got the window in between us, so they don't know I'm there. So getting uh, back to the uh, butterflies and the caterpillars, yeah. if you know what plant it is, and you see the caterpillar on it, you can more quickly deduce what kind of butterfly it is. Yeah. Because you know the native plant that it is. Right. And if it's a caterpillar, there's only a certain hand right. full of caterpillars that will use that as a host plant. And it's it's the same for the moths. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. If you like to identify moths, which 
well, my goodness, there are so many beautiful moths and they're caterpillars. Um, you know, you'll get clued in as Carl says, if you know what kind of plant they're on and vice versa. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, knowing your pollinators or your, your caterpillars is going to help you identify a plant. Yeah. I love sharing the story of um, Laura Henderson, who was also on our, on our committee. Um, when we went out into a natural area tracking a population of Baltimore checker spots, and we saw the Baltimore checker spots flying through a swampy, um, like boggy area, and we tracked it very carefully. And we had permission to be out there, so you have to be careful, but we had permission. We tracked it very carefully and found it circling around a plant. And neither of us instantly could recognize the plant and we know our stuff, right? Well, we looked at the plant a little bit more closely when the butterfly had fluttered away. And sure enough, on the underside of a, of a leaf were a patch of um, Baltimore checker spot eggs. Wow. So right then we were like, that's turtle head. Yeah, yeah. So very joyful, um, but there's lots of books. You know, if you're, if you love guides like I do, I collect them. This is another good one. It covers a lot of the different um, groups. Um, and then the Pollinators of Native Plants by Heather Holm. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl uh, mentioned this several times. I know Barb referenced this when she was creating the artwork um, and I couldn't resist, I had to get a copy. Um, and then there's also fun um, books like the Midwestern Native Gardener um, which similar to the concept shared by Doug Tallamy um, has a lot of options. What's cool in this book is there's also illust there's illustrations, um, but, mm -hmm. but the really neat feature is that they, they identif she identif identifies in this book um, some um, commonly used non-natives right. and an analogous replacement that will give you the same right. look as the non-native. But it will so it's kind of a plant this, not that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's very, it's plant very this awesome. instead of that. It's like, yeah. you know, the, the non-natives are all in red headings and then the native like alternatives are mm -hmm. in blue. So this is one of, another one of my favorites. Um, but I could just talk. <laughs> Can I actually, that's, that's a really good, really good transition to one of our questions. There we um, go. Okay. Plant, plant this, not that. So somebody asked, you know, if you're just starting out with replacing lawn with something else, but you live in a city and you're not ready to go full, you know, your yard, Carl, <laughs> do you have suggestions on, you know, something that's a little bit more low key that you could replace grass with that's kind of in, in that um, level, I suppose? Yes. Um, so something short like that. Well, if, if you're wanting to get started with flowers, you know, Forbes, you know, I would suggest, you know, cone flowers and black eyed Susans and uh, Monarda, uh, bee balm. You know, so those things, you know, they're probably 18 to 24 inches, they're like two feet high, and you could put clumps of them around and they're pretty more, you know, they can stay kind of contained. Uh, Liatris is another one. Um, it's a, a spiky flower. So yeah, um, Liatris, Coneflower, Black Eyed Susan, Bee Balm, those are some, you know, standard, you know, garden staples, if you will. Um, you know, things that stay low to the ground. Um, I'm not sure, you know, there are other grasses and sedges like pen sedge. Pen sedge grows to be about eight inches, but it gets about five inches and it starts to flap over. And it's kind of a cool cascading look. And when I say flap over, it's not like a mess, real messy aki look. So, um, you know, sedges and other grasses, oh, oh blue-eyed grass. There's a blue-eyed grass that you know stays um, you know pretty short and gets a nice little pretty blue flower. So pen sedge, blue-eyed grass, um, those are more grass-like, if you will. And if I might offer, um, one of the resources that we both shared is Prairie Moon Nursery. Oh yeah. They'll send you these catalogs, which are awesome because they're full of all of the beautiful flowers. But I've noticed in um, in their catalogs, they usually have a section on ecograss. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's backwards, but um, in here, there's 
you know, some options for purchasing bulk quantities of a short growing grass that you wouldn't have to mow. And it's not gonna look like the standard, you know, lawn, um, but it would get you sort of familiar with how that type of grass would grow. Mm -hmm. um, but then also consider um, some of our native ground covers um, or the spring ephemerals, you know, violets, for example, if you let them go in your lawn, if you don't pull them up, they will spread throughout your lawn. Even strawberries, yeah, native strawberries. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then they, what they you, stay short. Yeah. You, get, you start small, um, but then you can start to build in like really lovely paths. And so you can turn that concept of having a huge patch of green into having sections of the yard. Right. So it's another way to approach it. Um, but yeah, finding those low growing plants. And then imagine like if you got started with one of these like so-called eco grasses, um, then you could like build a border around it with some of the smaller growing yeah. uh, perennials. Yeah, like wild ginger, um, pussy toes. You know, these things are starting to come to mind now. Yeah. That's yeah. Hard, yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Thank you. Very helpful answers. Um, we have one of the questions so far. So when you have a, a, a garden established, but you have things coming up that you don't want there, so maybe invasive or something disruptive like poison ivy, how do you go about removing those plants without hurting the other plants that you don't want removed, like the native plants? Yeah, so the rule of thumb, you know, the, the best situation is try not to disturb the soil. As soon as you disturb the soil, you start to uncover more weed seeds, if you will, because the seed bank in your soil is full of uh, weed seeds. And as soon as you disturb that soil, um, you expose more weed seeds. So you could um, you know, put a, a thick layer of um, you know, leaves on top of it, because many of those weeds require sunlight to germinate and uh, things like that. So you could you know, smother it, if you will. Or um, another way, the mechanical way is you know, take a dandelion digger and you know, try to you know, get the root. And uh, so sometimes I use the dandelion digger to uh, you know, uh, get the weed. I try not to hoe anymore. Um, you know, early on, I would hoe, hoe, hoe. And then I would just start to cry <laughs> because you know hoeing doesn't really you know get you anywhere anymore. And but when I grew up, I, that's what I learned to do. I just thought, oh, well, you had to hoe it out. But um, that's really not the way. The the way is to disturb the soil as least as possible. Yeah, and another tip I would offer, um, in addition to to those helpful tips from from Carl, is to um, try like if you can't get out to do any pulling. Um, to do your best to cut the, the seed head, the, the flower off before it goes to seed mm -hmm. um, so that it doesn't start to spread in even more spots. Um, mm -hmm. But that also um, opens up the conversation about if, um, if you don't know, let it grow, um, which is a concept that Carl taught me. And it's so helpful. And thank you, Carl, because I have a huge patch of asters that I had been cutting. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know. And one year I finally said, you know, I really need to like know what this plant is. It, it loves this spot. And so I let it go to flower and realized I had these beautiful New England asters right where I would have wanted to plant them. Um, but if it had turned out to not be an aster and was like another situation where I didn't know, so I let it grow, I watched the plant flower, I was able to identify it and realized it was not something I wanted in my, in my garden, it was uh, invasive. And so I made sure that um, I, I pulled them out. I do a lot of hand pulling um, shortly after a rain when the soil is a little bit looser. Um, so that it doesn't require digging all around the plant, but I can just sort of pull. And that doesn't always work, but it does sometimes. And in this case, it did. But if it hadn't worked, then I would have gone through and cut it off so that it couldn't complete its life cycle. 
and then um, you know covered that base with leaves so that it didn't have the light it needed to regrow. Mm -hmm. well, that's a good point, Vicki. Uh, if you don't know, let it grow. Um, is sometimes very hard to identify things when they're really small. And your native plants, they probably will move around uh, your garden just because uh, you know, a great uh, example is Monarda punctata. I, mean, I think it's called a horse mint, but um, yeah, I learned to identify it now and it does come up in different parts of my yard. And so, um, but if you, if you just don't want anything there, another way you know, could be to burn it. You know, I did buy one of those pointed torches. It has about a three foot long tube. And um, so I'm ex I've been experimenting with that over the last few months or last toward the end of the fall uh, last year, you know, uh, burning things, you know, a point spot sh 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 burning. Wow, I'd never considered that. So small scale fire management. And yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Right, with the, I mean, the question, um, I kind of expounded on that because I was curious about all kinds of, um, plant species, but the question was specific to uh, poison ivy. And I think that burning would probably be pretty cathartic, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it feel good. Yeah, and, and realize that, you know, the more that more time and interaction that you have with your garden, um, the more familiar you're going to be with your plant mm -hmm. and you actually develop a relationship with them. Right. Um, so that, you know, you get really excited when you see the plant has returned and it's sprouting up and you watch it go through its life cycle. And in through that process, you, you know, are acutely aware of what it looks like in different stages of its life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they do pop up in other spots, you're like, ah, I love you, but not there. Let's right. go, <laughs> you know, let me move you and put you over there. And also, you know, keeping in mind that some of our native plants do like to spread a lot. And so, um, you know, that's a really great opportunity if you've got an area that you want some coverage on, but you don't want to spend a lot of time, you can pop in some native plants and you're set. Mm -hmm. All set. So, yes, well, this has been good. I Do we have any other questions? No. No other questions. Um, before I, I turn it over to you to wrap up, I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, yes. First, I have included the link to downloading our pollinator garden landscaping guide in the description of this video. Um, so please head over to our website and download your copy. Or as Victoria mentioned, we do have physical copies at our office in Michigan City. Um, this recording is going to live on our Facebook page, so I encourage you to um, revisit it, maybe take some screenshots of all that really great information that was shared, and share it with your network so that we can grow our army of pollinator warriors. Um, and we are also going to be uploading it onto our YouTube page, so some folks don't like Facebook, and that's okay. We're going to uh, provide that YouTube link. It's going to go into Save the Dunes monthly e-newsletter. Um, if you're not signed up for our e-newsletter, you can go to our website and sign up for that as well. So you can stay tuned on everything we have coming up. And that's all I have. Well, thank you, Katie, for facilitating us this evening. Thank you, Carl, for being so generous with your time, your knowledge, your wisdom um, to join us this evening. And to all of you that are watching, all, that you, all of you that are passionate about Native gardens and our pollinators, um, we've We've got some incredibly joyful work ahead of us. So thank you for all that you do. And until soon. Ciao, ciao. Bye.